Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today, we're taking a more nuanced look at the commodity supercycle. Traditionally, in a supercycle, all commodity prices make a secular shift upwards. The general thesis at the moment is that energy transition, redistributed policies across the globe, as well as a shift from just-in-time to just-in-case supply chains in the wake of potential deglobalization, is causing a secular shift up across the commodity space. And we've certainly seen that in the indices. However, the picture might be somewhat more nuanced, and some of those prices might be a consequence more of hype than reality. Our guest is Ivo Sajanovic. Ivo is a non-executive director for a number of agricultural companies. He's a venture capitalist in the ag tech space and is adjunct professor at the Ditella University in Buenos Aires and at the University of Geneva. Ivo had a 25-year-long career at Cargill and was latterly the CEO of Alvion, one of the biggest sugar traders in the world. Ivo, thanks for joining. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. So we are essentially unpicking the commodity supercycle with the general thesis that it might not be such a monolithic, unidirectional move for all of the commodities as we, we, we have been hearing. Before we sort of dig into how perhaps the different commodities might be affected differently, and there's some, there's some complications in the story as is, could you, I guess, give us an, a rough working premise on what a commodity supercycle is from, from your point of view? Sure, that's a good idea because otherwise we are having a lot of debates about super cycle and nobody seems to be defining what a cyber cycle is. And it's useful to have some consensus around the definition before the discussion. So the academic literature defines the super cycle as a strong, general and sustained increase in the prices of all commodity classes, deviating its values from long-term equilibrium trends. I guess you've got this secular rise up in prices. Can you give us just some sense of when we look back at historical super cycles, how long they last? Perhaps give us some potted history of super cycles in, in recent economic memory. Well, you have cycles. When you study economic cycles, you have cycles of different lengths for different tastes. So you may identify short cycles of 40 months. You have mid cycles of eight years. Then you have very long term cycles named contra TF cycles of 54 years. However, when people speak about super cycles in commodity, they identify that they last between 10 and 35 years. And those are 10 and 35 years of continuous price increases. Now, to make things a bit more complicated, some people started speaking about a mini super cycle, which to some extent is a contradiction in terms, because if a mini super cycle is a short one, and people say that, okay, mini super cycle, it's like three, four years, which in my opinion, that's a normal price cycle that we have all the time. And I guess crucial, so we're already sort of teeing up a more complicated picture. Are these things predictable? Can we tell where we are at any given point? Or they always require a, an ex post rationalization? Well, as a start, I think it's useful to identify how many super cycles we had in the recent past. If you take the last 150 years of history, you can identify four super cycles. One was around the First World War, with the industrialization taking place in that moment. The second one was around the Second World War, the reconstruction effort. Then you had the Korean War and the Japanese industrialization. Third one, we have in the 70s, a super cycle which was more supply-driven, related with the gold devaluation in the U.S. and with the birth of the OPEC. And the last one is the one that probably we all experience from roughly 2004 to 2015 with the China accession to the WTO. At the same moment, we started with biofuels mandates and also we experienced the financialization of the commodity market. So all those three things together creating the last super cycle. Now, if 2020 onwards, we are starting a new one, I don't think we can project it ex ante. I think probably after 10, 15 years, we are going to be able to rationalize it ex post. But I think it's pretty hard, given all the variables that are changing all the time, to identify a super cycle so in advance. Yeah, I want to come on to the sort of the rationalization for the current one. Before we do that, have historical super cycles, to use the phrase, all ships rose in that tide, did ag, metals and energy 
talking very simply, all prices rise across the board, or were they also nuanced? What can we learn from historical supercycles? Well, you always have changes in relative values, but to identify a supercycle, you have the three classes rising together to different extent, but the three of them rising together. This is part of the definition of a supercycle. Okay, so the current one, and if I can try and simplify the general thesis right now, it's essentially you've got you've had underinvestment for let's say eight years across the board, particularly in metals and energy due to low prices. You know that has its own impact on supply and demand. But the extra drivers, as we've had in all of those super cycles you've just mentioned, whether it was war, whether it was China, this time is ultimately about energy transition and associative redistributive policies. So this is Goldman Sachs, uh, Rev, you've got the redistributive policies, you've got energy transition, and then also an impact of the coronavirus has been this recognition that supply chains have been quite fragile, they certainly have uh, nationalistic interests and so forth, and you've got a, a more um, a let deglobalization arguably going on. So all of these things are coming together to create the current commodity super cycle. And we have seen, you just have to look at the GSCI or whatever index you might look at, you know, they've all risen substantially since the, the beginning of the year. Do we, you know, in your view, is there evidence to support that general thesis? How does that, you know, is that, is that a, a defensible position uh, as to what we're seeing right now? I think you have some ingredients for the super cycle, but you don't have all the things which are needed. So if you go one by one among the reasons you just mentioned, certainly the less inequality argument, which is based on expansive monetary and fiscal policies, which are driving growth, it's uh, quite uh, weak, in my opinion, because I think the monetary policy that we are experiencing is creating actually a lot of inequality. When you have interest rates at zero, you have a lot of financial assets and real estate going to the moon, and this is not promoting equality. And certainly fiscal policies may be offsetting that, but it's very partial. Then the energy transition, I think, is a real reason. I think because we are going to go from, let's say, 80% fossils and 20% renewables today to the opposite, 80% renewables and 20% fossils in 30 years. Certainly, that is going to have a real impact, and we are going to see the value of metals uh, gaining in relative terms versus fossils, certainly, which are going to lose value in the midterm. Then the, from just in time to just in case uh, global supply chains, I think it's valid as well, but it's a one-off. I don't think this is going to lead you to a sustained price increase beyond the short-term impact of it. And the China decoupling, which is the one that says that demand is going to become decentralized and is going to be probably more impactful in the US and Europe versus China, I have my doubts. I think, uh, especially after the last super cycle, China was the big engine, and now China expanded the economy in 2020 uh, very strongly. Now it's starting to disaccelerate, and I think it's going to have an impact in the demand of metals and other products. And I don't think that the U.S. and uh, Europe are going to be able to sustain the cycle in themselves. There is a concept which I think is important to keep in mind all the time, and it's commodity intensity. So not all the economies, they go through the same commodity intensity. One thing was China 20 years ago expanding, and that had a much stronger commodity intensity than what China may have in the next years. And as for what I'm basically reading, and I was reading recently a very interesting article by Yumana Salihin from CRU, she doesn't expect in the case of the big infrastructure plants in the US and Europe, a strong impact on metals, for example. So really out of the three in your view there's only really the one that has a defensible or at least sustainable impact which would be this energy transition which we shouldn't uh, underestimate the impact of that but we're not i guess those redistributed policies it's also coupled with monetary inflation as well or low interest rates basically which come on to but there's not necessarily in scale to defeat what you're seeing in kind of just rise of asset prices and inequality generally. And then you've got this, I guess there's, there's a couple of things there to just dig into. One is you're not confident on the 
the decoupling with China, all that is a nice phrase you use just in just in time to just in case supply chains. And also actually that uh, you're not necessarily going to see the same commodity intensity from China. And there is something something else I would like to add. The world economy contracted at three, four percent in 2020. Now this year is going to expand at six to seven percent. So probably at the at this moment. Uh, the world economy has the same size than it had at the end of 2019. Let's call the end of 2019 uh, the pre-COVID era. Okay. Now, the world was growing before that at 3% per year. So if you compare that growth path versus today, maybe the world economy is not going to have the same size that it was going to have during pre-COVID days until 2023. And on top of that, the growth path is highly heterogeneous. You have economies growing at very different paces. So you have the U.S. economy expanded very fast, while you have, for example, Latin America economy contracting, and it's not going to have the same size maybe until much later. Yes, and I guess you've got these kind of there's there's trying to unpick as I'm thinking through it right now. Right, you've got the the population growth, which will impact things like food and so forth or agriculture. In China, it's interesting you say, is there an argument that China has sort of overbuilt from the last commodity super cycle and actually just don't need the same level of infrastructure, housing, city growth that you need, that, that we saw in the last super cycle? Yeah, I think there is a bit of that. I agree with that point. I think, uh, the, again, the commodity intensity is not going to be the same. So China can grow at a similar pace, which I think is not going to be the case either. I think China will keep growing, but at a accelerated pace but with a lower commodity intensity. Okay, so let's dig into kind of then, so taking these threads, creating, I guess, you know, a more nuanced picture of a commodity super cycle and actually using the definition of all commodity prices rising, I guess, ending up at a question mark whether there actually is going to be one. Each vertical has a different story, energy, metals, and ags. I think it's clearer for metals and ags. Can we just talk about energy first? I know this isn't, you know, where you focused your career, but looking at, at fossil fuels, what's your view of energy prices over the next decade? And how would you, how would you situate that in the potential super cycle? I think something that most of the people don't do when analyzing prices in the past and forecasts is to speak about prices in real terms. Uh, as an Argentine, I cannot avoid thinking in real terms because if I think in nominal terms, I finish very confused. Actually, when people compare prices of commodities in history, they always speak about prices in nominal terms. So if you take, for example, the price of uh, crude oil in the 70s, that was $10 per barrel, that's equivalent to $70 today. In real terms, prices didn't move. Now, if you take the price of uh, crude in 2008, when it reached $140, that's equivalent in real terms to $170. And today we are at 70 so from that perspective, uh, I would say that we are at a pretty fair level, normal values. Fine, we are much higher than one year ago when we had the crisis and when we have a technicality in the market. But if you clean what happened during the, that V in that valley, and if you compare current values with pre-COVID levels, we are just above them. So from an energy perspective, okay, we are, I would say, at normal values. So I don't see energy leading the super cycle. On top of that, you have a lot of different indexes uh, with different weights in commodities, but you can say that roughly 57% of all the commodities are energy, 23% are agricultural prices, the other 20% are metals. Of the 100% commodity world, the king of the commodities is crude, it's 42% of the total. So when you have the king of the commodities, quoting at normal levels, I think it's difficult to make the case that you're in a super cycle. If you take copper, for example, yeah, copper, it's very high price, but copper is only 4% of the total. So depending on how you weigh things, you can present different stories. There is that argument out there, which is, which is, I think, a valid one, in that the challenge perhaps for the fossil energy markets are that we haven't yet hit peak demand, according to most economists. Uh, we haven't even yet hit peak demand in coal, which is quite a striking fact. But yet the willingness to invest in new production, in proven reserves in the case of crude, 
the entire sort of financial constructs behind supporting companies, whether that's shareholders or debt markets, pretty lackluster. So there is sort of this idea that as that overall market degrades in the wake of energy travel, in the face of energy transition, you could see some real spikes in prices for fossil fuels. Is that something that has a place in this discussion? Yeah, I think you can have a disorganized energy transition. And because of that, you may have more volatility than in an ideal world. But in any case, I doubt very much we are going to see anything close to what we saw in the previous super cycle, because we know that because the energy transition, demand is going to start vanishing rather soon. Okay, it doesn't mean that tomorrow prices are going to collapse, but in the midterm, everyone expects to see prices losing ground. Even today, the oil market is inverted. So prices from today to one year, it's 10% lower. And that's the case with a lot of commodities. It's not only with crude oil. If you go into the agri world, you will see that soybeans and maize are inverted too. Yeah. And it's fascinating. We'll come back to what this all means for the markets themselves, investors and and investment. But it's fascinating when you you talk about the prevalence, the, the representation of just crude in these indexes. And that could have a real impact on uh, on how how those particular indexes perform. Okay, so so the next one is is metals. This seems to be a much clearer case, given it's tying to energy transition, at least a certain suite of them, uh, Doctor Copper in particular. Can you just just unpack metals a little bit for us? Well, I'm far from an expert, but everything I read in terms of the energy transition leads to okay additional demand for batteries or for different things. Of course, some of these things are going to have also environmental impact. So it's not that, that, let's say, clear. But uh, I think the choice is made. The electrification of car fleet is going to lead to higher prices in metals. So I think what we are going to have, more than a super cycle, I think we are going to have a new constellation of relative values where metals are going to gain, fossil fuels are going to lose, and agris, which have a very rapid supply response, are not going to be able to hold at current levels, but they are going to stay in the next three, four years above the level that we saw before COVID. So that's a bit my my view in general. So metals gaining versus the other two. In metals, in that picture, I think it's very clear, as you say, sort of those metals associated with energy transition, battery metals, etc., it's interesting when you talk about that that commodity intensity, but you know we might not see the same demand for ferrous metals, iron ore, if you're not seeing that kind of China story pick back up, or a replacement for China, you know India, whatever it might be, also seeing similar levels of of, of rapid development. Do you see that bifurcation between kind of and again I know it's not your your area of of, of deep expertise, but between kind of the, the, those energy transition metals and the construction metals, for want of a better description. Yeah, I think we are going to see they are those related with electrification gaining in relative terms versus the other. Great. So let's talk agri. Just before we talk about the the current and the future, like where where do we where have agri prices been in general, and where have they sort of gone over the last couple of years? Can you sort of paint the background for us? Well, after the last super cycle that finished probably in 2012, 2013, okay, we had prices uh, moving down and staying pretty quiet when the market lost volatility until uh, now with the big bounce. Now, the reason of the big bounce, I think it's a combination of two things. On the demand side, you have two strong pools. One is China recovering from the African swine fever, recovering the population of hogs and also starting to buy maize. So that's one of the anchors. And the other one is the renewable diesel in the U.S. pulling the prices of vegetable oils to very high levels. So I think these are the two anchors on the demand side. Now, on the supply side, even if we didn't have any major problem with crops, uh, we had several minor issues with crops. So if you start with the summer 2020 in the U.S., uh, both the soybean and maize crops finished smaller than expected. Then you had La Nina in South America affecting both uh, maize and soybeans in Argentina and Brazil. Then we had a drought for the second crop in Brazil maize. And lately we had frost where uh, okay, we saw 
smaller crops in sugar, in coffee. And now this year is, again, we are having floods somewhere, drought in Canada. So it's pretty complex from the weather part. These supply issues are impacting the market as well. So I think it's a combination. It's not only about demand. And this is why I believe that in the future, if you go to more normal supply, I think markets are going to ease a bit. Yeah. So you've got a couple of, I guess, acute or short-term impacts there, that mini super cycle, right? So you mentioned hogs and renewable diesel. We've we've covered renewable diesel. That certainly is having an impact, whether that um, will be allowed to continue given the impact on food prices around the world and also the environmental impact of palm and so forth, palm oil. Could you just, I don't know how how prevalent this story is outside of the ag world, but I mean, that swine fever had an immense impact on the agricultural market. Can you just give us a bit more on that? Well, I think to, to, to put it in very graphic terms, you have 50% of the world hog population in China in 2018, and they lost between 40 and 50% of that hog population. So the world lost between 20 and 25% of all the hogs. Okay, and that had a tremendous impact in feed demand. Feed demand in China collapsed. Soybean imports went from 95 million metric tons to 85 million metric tons. And now, okay, it recovered again. So things look a bit more, more normal. And so China normalized purchases in the last month. But eventually China probably overbought because they also imported to back the lack of local meat, a lot of meat. China used to be an importer of four or five million metric tons of meat from the world. And in the last year, they imported 10 million metric tons. So when you combine all the feed they imported, including maize, which is a novelty because usually they imported only seven, eight million metric tons of maize and they went up to almost 30. On top of that, 10 million metric tons of sorghum and barley. And if you add 10 million metric tons of meat, that sounds like uh, it's a lot. So now today you have in the Chinese market very low prices for uh, pigs. And this is starting to have an impact in crash margins and eventually is going to lead to a much more normal progression in terms of purchases. Uh, certainly, China is not going to continue expanding at the pace it did it in the last year and it's going to go to more normal numbers. And if you accumulate both grains and meat, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if we see probably less amount bought in the next year. So we see that normalizing. The two big... It's fair to say in the uh, ag has not really been zoomed in on on this kind of talk about a commodity super cycle. There's not really, you know, when you talk about energy transition, redistributed policies, okay, that could, you know, people might be transitioning to more processed food or whatever that might be. It seems to have been skipped over somewhat, which is why in, you know, ultimately we're focusing on it here. You've got these two two big things, right? There's demand, you know, which I guess is population growth and population income. And then you've got supply, which is very much impacted by, uh, well, could be very much impacted by climate change. Can we tackle those two aspects in detail? So that let's talk about demand over the next 10 years, the typical commodity super cycle lifespan. Is, you know, are people forecasting increased population growth to the point where we'll have an outsized demand of impact on prices? Do we see changing consumer habits on a global basis? What's, what's the, the thought there? Well, the population will go from 7.7 .7 billion today to 8.5 billion in 2030. And because of this thing we discussed about commodity intensity, the percentage of growth in terms of food demand is going to decrease versus the last decade. Uh, you are going to have some low and middle income economies uh, growing, but the more mature economies are going to probably be pretty stable. So the percentage of growth is going to be there because you have population growth and GDP growth, but it's going to be much slower than in the past. Then, of course, you have okay, different stories around different geographies that I'm speaking over all. And on the supply side, we expect production, world production to expand at roughly 1.4% per year to meet that higher demand. And it's going to be mostly because of better yields, slightly more area in total. Coming back a bit to the, to the current super cycle and speaking about supply, one of the problems I have with one of the main theories supporting the super cycle is this idea of the weak dollar. The US index measures 
the strength or the weakness of the dollar versus six currencies, which are not very much related to the agriculture world. So 50% of that index is the euro, where certainly the dollar got weaker, and there you have more demand power in Europe. Then you have the yen, where you have the same effect. Then you have the pound, where it's a pretty marginal, I think, player in all this agriculture equation. Then you have Canada, the Swiss franc, and the Swedish crown. But you are missing all the currencies, actually, which are agriculture producer currencies, which, as a matter of fact, they lost value versus the dollar. They didn't gain value versus the dollar. So if you take the real since January 2020, the real lost 30% of its nominal value and probably 20% of its real value, if you net it from inflation. And you have similar things happening in Russia with the ruble, in Ukraine, in Argentina with the peso. So you can make the case that in dollar terms today, it's cheaper to produce most of the crops. Historically, agriculture prices, they tend to the unitary cost of production in marginal areas. So if today you can produce these crops at cheaper levels because you have weaker currencies there, I think the markets are going to basically feel that. If you combine this with the fact that the price of crude is not that high, there is a very strong correlation of roughly 77% between the price of crude and agri prices. I think it's difficult to make the case that agricultural prices, they need to continue moving up. Yeah, so actually, we're across the board, you're talking ultimately for energy and for ag, you've got these inflationary pressures rather than fundamental, typical supply-demand issues that have driven previous commodity super cycles. Is that right? Yeah. Actually, when you analyze the big bounce we had since the, let's say, valley in 2020, there are three reasons. One is reflation, where you go back to, let's say, the pre-COVID level. That's most of the move. Second, you have fundamental reasons, like we discussed before, in the case of agri, China, renewable diesel, weather problems. And third, you have this inflationary thing. Now, I'm quite skeptical of this theory that you need to buy agricultural commodities to hedge against inflation. I think, actually, in the long term, if you try to run any correlation, you are going to see that there is no correlation. And as a matter of fact, the prices of agriculture loses versus inflation. So if you take any long-term trend, actually, it has to be a very bad hedge. And this is explained by the fact that, okay, there is much higher productivity, which is offsetting that. But if you measure things per unit, agricultural commodity has been a very, very bad hedge against inflation. Where does where do the broader commodities as an asset class is that having a role at all? You've got, I mean, ultimately, you know, you've got all this hype about a super cycle. You do have capital flows into the commodity markets. Is that a self fulfilling prophecy that won't last? Or, you know, what's the view there? I think in the last super cycle, in the 2000s, uh, okay, we have this theory that uh, in order to diversify your equities, commodities were a good asset class to try. And because of that, yeah. Certainly, we had a lot of inflows in the market. Then that eased during the last 10 years, and now we have some financial money coming back. Uh, now, there is a lot of debate academically about what's the impact of those uh, fund swings, commodity prices. And if I think basically if I were about agriculture, I would say that funds, they can change the trajectory of prices, but they cannot change the fundamental values. So if you have a market where you have a well-developed and well-functioning delivery mechanism, you have conversions all the time between derivatives and the physical world. So for every option that you trade in the market, you have a warranted conversion. Therefore, yeah, prices can get disconnected, let's say, for maybe one or two months, but not longer than that, because otherwise okay, you get conversions once again. So in my humble opinion, current prices are real. They have a strong fundamental reason. They may have a marginal uh, spec component, but that's not the reason of why we are so high here. And that's supported by inverses uh, or backwardation in energy terms. Otherwise, if this would be only a hedge versus inflation, we should have markets in a carry, and actually we should have the back end of the curve higher than the spot. Otherwise, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Before we come on to the consequences for both businesses and investors and people in the commodity space, if if this super cycle story doesn't necessarily hold true, can you just sum up for us? So 
we have this current rise in prices. Is this short term? Is this medium term? What's the what's sort of the the, the analysis, if you'd like, of, of whether there is or isn't a commodity super cycle, and and what we should be expecting as far as your crystal ball will allow over the next few years? I think in the case of agricultural products, I would say that uh, the markets are going okay, assuming no extra weather problems, right? Because we cannot predict that. But I would say that markets are going to struggle to hold at current levels and they are going to find a new equilibrium, which is going to be in between prices of pre-COVID and current price. So if I take, for example, soybeans as an example, soybeans were trading at $8 to $10 per bushel before the COVID, and now they are trading at $13 to $14. And I, w- I would say that probably the, the new equilibrium for the next three to five years is more in the 10 to 12 area. And then you come back relative values using probably soybeans as a sort of an anchor and then you can relate that to maize and to other products. So yeah, I think we are going to stay higher than we were before COVID, but we are going to be lower than today. And then on the the metals, we've we've highlighted this new constellation of prices. You've got, you know, some will will continue to rise probably quite dramatically, you know, that have uh, much less supply talked about this in in previous episodes around things like lithium and so forth and then energy you know it sounds like you're if not bearish then relatively um uh sort of you know it's going to be a a flat market and and doesn't really represent an increase in prices if you take into account inflation is is that fair as regards fossil fuels yeah i think that's a fair summary keep in mind that every year if we have inflation at four or five percent like 2021 in the US, every year that prices, they stay flat. Actually, prices went down 4 or 5%. Yeah. Do you see, uh, as an Argentine, you, you've been through this a couple of times, um, do you see inflation stalking the, the global markets? It, could it, how serious do you think it, this could get? I think there is a fair chance of, yeah, we are seeing already 4 or 5% inflation in the US. And I think uh, if the Fed doesn't react, I think that inflation is probably going to go higher. I'm not that worried about the rest of the world in terms of inflation, but I think the magnitude of fiscal and monetary expansion in the U.S. is leading to higher inflation. But on the other hand, I don't think the Fed is going to do nothing. And this is another reason why I'm a bit uh, dubious about the super cycle, because I'm expecting the Fed to raise interest rates higher um, earlier than other economies. And if interest rates are moving up, that is going to be headwinds for commodities. So you, you sit on the board of a number of organizations in the in the agriculture space. Also, obviously, you know, as your, with your VC hat on, what does this mean for businesses in the commodities sector? Got all this investment or capital flows coming in, you've got a lot of hype. You know, it sounds like it could be quite dangerous if, if you're not in one of these areas where you've got sort of real fundamental tailwinds that quickly things might... Uh, run out of steam much earlier than expected. And traditionally in the commodity markets, you know, you do have these big cycles. And in the in the good times, that's when these businesses build up their their war chests to survive the downturns. I can imagine that if the the upturn isn't I have to having having out to come through quite a sustained trough, if people don't if organizations don't have a sufficient time to make hay to build back up those war chests, it could be quite a challenging twenty years. Let's say 2020 and 2021 are a wonderful year for commodity companies, certainly much, much better than the previous decade. And I don't think that in the next three, four years, we are going to go back to the previous decade. I think we are going to be somewhere in between. So I think there is still a pretty interesting story to trade around. I believe that this is not going to be super smooth. Stocks are very low everywhere. So I think you have warranted volatility to trade around. And this is a very good input okay for commodity companies to be profitable another thing is in terms of volatility i like to distinguish between good volatility and bad volatility i think this is good volatility because you can trade around while bad volatility is the volatility that you don't understand and is more related probably to policy to tweets that probably force you to take risk out of the table but when the volatility is of a fundamental nature i think it's more interesting to to be traded and certainly it's a very good input for the income equation of most of these companies. Yeah. Uh, and what about sort of this idea that actually, I guess, organizations have to be much more scalpel-like. I, ma- I imagine this has never changed, but as they, they think about these markets, which 
which commodities, which products are going to sort of fare better in this overall decarbonization and energy transition world. Because you've kind of got this story of renewable diesel, but that's got some complications around it. You also have, um, you know, alternative proteins and so forth more broadly. Our organizations are going to have to be much more sort of scalpel-like as they, as they think about investments. Yes, I think the future from that perspective is more uncertain because you have um, some of the big decisions to be made demand more policy related. You have, like we described before, in the case of Agris, the two anchors of demand are China, which is not that easy to predict because it's a very political nature, most of the decisions versus a normal, let's say, PNL. And the energy transition is also highly political. So the price system is not necessarily working in these two areas. And when the price system is not working, things are more unpredictable. So, yeah, it's not that easy to make a long-term projection when you have so many decisions in the hands of politics. So you are an adjunct professor, both in Latin America and in, and in Europe. A big challenge that commodity markets faces in general, just like assets, there's been a lack of investment in the next generation for the last eight years. So you do kind of have this same challenge around succession and bench strength across the markets. Are you seeing fewer students interested in the sector? Are those students more concerned about ESG issues? What, what are you seeing from that community and, and, and how perhaps can organizations pre best prepare to, to capture that talent? I think certainly there is like a change in values and a lot of ideas that were mainstream in the past, now they are radical. And a lot of ideas that were radical in the past, they are mainstream now. And young people, they have a lot of concerns that probably we didn't have 30 years ago. So the sector will have to, to deal properly with those concerns. But on the other hand, there is a lot of interest, I think, for the commodity sector and because of all the possibilities that it brings. I think probably the companies are not doing enough in terms of promoting education. There are some great stories like what's taking place in the University of Geneva. Also, there is a course organizing the University of Rotterdam. There is something happening as well in Colorado. But I think okay, we can do more to promote how interest in this sector to be able to attract uh, more students. Yes, I mean, it's, um, of course, if you are passionate about decarbonization, this is one sector where you can really have an immediate impact, given its, you know, current consequence for that climate change, right? And as you say, there are actually relatively few dedicated commodity programs. And I think some of that is because it's such a cyclical market that it's, you don't get that sustained investment that you get in things like biotech or, or whatever it might be, which is always and you know has always been a challenge and in many ways why much of the commodity leadership of the last generation ultimately were in it as a result of their parents being in it, right? You know, there's sort of a generational thing that's in commodities, you know, that uh, is, is hard to sustain, <clears throat> you know, for the long term, you know, especially as these markets now need to start getting talent from other sectors, you know, digitization, you know, energy transition is a lot less market driven, much more technologically driven. You know, so it is going to be a, there are some, so are some headwinds there as well. Yeah, keep in mind that those schools that I mentioned, they educate probably not more than 100 people per year. So yeah, there is a big, big space there, I think, to, to develop in terms of education for commodity trading and for value chains and all these different aspects. So if I could ask you, I guess, give us your final conclusions on the on the commodities super cycle in, in inverted commas. You know, what do you see? Is it one and, and what can you see over the next couple of years? So as a summary, I don't see a commodity super cycle taking place, first of all, because like I said at the beginning, you cannot identify a super cycle in advance. This is something that you can rationalize ex post. But when I read the ingredients about why we may go into super cycle, I believe that we have some of them, but others are lacking. I think the main difference is what's happening in the energy world. I think without crude moving up, I think it's pretty difficult to define a super cycle as a super cycle. Then I do see a new constellation of relative prices where metals are gaining, energies are staying at normal level, and agris are going to stay higher than in the pre-COVID level, but lower than today.
Fantastic. Well, we are honoured to have had you as a guest, Ivo. It's been a very interesting and insightful discussion. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks to you. It was very nice to share this conversation with you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global, where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offering as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening.